Okay, everyone, we are going to get started. Welcome, welcome. My name is Kyle Jeffries, and I will be your host for this presentation. We are excited that you're joining us on this Saturday morning uh, for a really important topic. But before we start the presentation, I want to briefly go over some of the features that are available for you during this webinar. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, Doug's going to be going ahead and putting this up real fast. The next slide, please, Doug. While he's hitting that, there you go. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you should locate a control panel as well as a Q&A feature. The purpose of the uh, Q&A, or excuse me, the purpose of the chat feature is to discuss any technical difficulties uh, that you're experiencing throughout the webinar, whether that be the audio or visual. Um, we will definitely do our best to resolve these issues. But if for some reason the issues cannot be fixed, uh, please do not worry. This presentation will be recorded. And if you reach out to me after the webinar is completed, I will go ahead and send you a copy. The last feature is the Q&A option, where you are able to ask questions that are relevant to the firescaping topic throughout the presentation. Um, the questions will be read to the instructor. If for some reason your question isn't answered, um, during the webinar, our instructor has de dedicated some additional time to respond to questions after the web webinar is completed. Um, just a quick introduction. My name is Kyle Jeffries. I am your host and panelist today. If you could click on the next, there you go. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm the Conservation and Water Budget Analyst at Rancho Water. And today our instructor will be Doug Kent. He's the author of the book, Firescaping, protecting your home with a fire resistant landscape. Uh, just a brief background on Doug. Doug is a specialist in uh, ecological land management. He focuses primarily on fire protection, resource conservation, and urban harvest. His work is aimed at making the greatest ecological impact for the lowest ecological cost. And as a practice, he works with landowners, land managers, and landscape professionals. Uh, in addition, he uh, has over 27 years of experience in firescaping, has written over eight books and 50 articles, and currently teaches at the California Polytechnic University, Pomona. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Doug, to begin the presentation. And Doug, again, we are excited that, to have you and thank you for educating us on such an important topic. Thank you, Kyle. That was a generous introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that was really nice. Well, I'm really grateful to be here, um, everybody, and thanks so much for welcoming me into your homes. And it's a real honor to uh, to do this. So when we have um, 63 slides and the whole state of California to traverse um, today. And so let's just get started. Um, here's a question you really can't answer, but just think about it. How many wildfires are there in California every year? And what is the significance of this picture um, on the screen? Well, there's, um, to answer the first question, there's over 8,000 wildfires a year. Um, we don't read about, we only read about probably uh, five or 4% of those. Um, and those are the ones that uh, get ignited and just spread during extreme fire weather, causing all kinds of uh, damage and mayhem. Uh, but we average about 8,000 wildfires a year. And the significance of this picture right here is this is the witch fire from 2007. And you're looking at Escondido and the hills behind the Santa, um, San Diego Safari Park. And that was a Whopper fire. And the significance of this is because in 2003, um, San Diego County had suffered a massive fire with the Cedar Fire. And Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger was just traumatized by that. 2007, he is determined to make sure that the Cedar Fire and the Witch Fire never happen again. And so he up changes um, brush clearance guidelines and um, massively funds the fire departments um, in California uh, since 2007. Uh, this next slide shows the 20 worst fires in California's history. 
The ones that are um, bolded in orange to the left are all the fires that have happened since 2007, the witch fire. So since we changed the laws, um, 10 of the 20 worst fires have occurred. Seven of the top 10 have occurred. Three of the top five have occurred. And the two worst fires we've ever had in the state's history have occurred um, since we changed the law. And so maybe, um, maybe Californians didn't need more laws. Maybe that wasn't the way to save us because it is absolutely not helped. Um, Californians um, live safely in fire country. So I'm just going to back up real quickly and just talk just a little bit about this work. Um, I moved into Northern California, Mill Valley um, in Marin County in January of 1992. And that was two and a half months after the Oakland Berkeley tunnel fire. Now at the time that was a dramatic fire. Um, that was 2,900 homes and 25 lives lost in just 10 hours. The whole Bay Area was traumatized. And the bottom picture shows um, the view of where I was living off the balcony. And um, that whole valley um, had burnt in the 1930s. It had burned all Mount Tam, Mill Valley, Corte Madera, Sausalito it had burned into. And so we, I was living in a, an area with fire history and I became determined um, to help my little neighborhood um, reduce the risk of fire. So that started in 1992. And I eventually wrote a gardening guide for Marin County that turned into a uh, gardening book um, for the whole state in 2005. And then um, since 2005, I've been touring the entire state working with um, at-risk communities um, from Northern California all the way to the Mexican border. And then, uh, you know, that book sold out. And then we had a new and improved book come out um, last October. Um, but really, the motivation with um, my work in firescaping came when I was um, writing for the Home and Garden section for the Marin Independent Journal. And I was um, sent to cover the fire, um, the Mount Vision fire of October 1995. And I was just there to interview the survivors. Um, what did they do on their property that enabled them to have success? And pictured here is Miss Biller. And Miss Baylor um, lived on a lived in a track where um, three out of the four homes had been destroyed by the Mount Vision fire, and her home had survived um, despite being in a Bishop Pine forest. And um, it was just incredibly traumatizing to be three days on that fire, um, watching the residents come home, find the fate of their house, um, and just all the trauma of that. And I just became so motivated um, to help other people, people that want to help themselves, um, how to protect themselves. So this presentation is all about that, uh, the 27 years I've spent on this. Here's the problem in California. Megafires, firestorms, and fire weather are now more common. Scientists, fire professionals, and ecologists still believe the worst is ahead. There's two reasons driving these changes, and they're well known. You already know them. The first one is a warming planet. Um, California has been warming for about 8,000 years, and in the last 150, that warming has accelerated. I know a lot of locals out there can testify that our winters are a little warmer than they used to be. When we put that much more heat in the atmosphere, we increase the likelihood of, of uh, dramatic events like um, fire weather, um, those days of exceptionally hot temperatures, low, low humidity, and windy days are increasing in number now in California. So our likelihood of getting fire weather has increased. And then also, um, just there are more people in fire country. According to fire experts, there are over 46 million homes representing a population of 100 million that live in high fire hazard areas in the United States. 25% of all Californians live with the risk of losing their home. 
we just have more people. You know, back in the olden days, the people that lived in fire country were your um, scofas. They were your, <laughs> your beekeepers and your grazers and your outlaws and your artists. Um, we just didn't, well, and then in the 1950s, when everybody in California got a car, nobody had to live next to their job anymore or next to their school or next to the grocery store. We could live wherever. And, and Californians, after the 1950s, just went into the hills. They were no longer shackled to the city. And ever since then, we've seen an increase in fire as more and more people have moved out um, into fire country. So those are the two problems warming state and more people, more at risk in, in high fire hazard areas. So all I'm gonna be talking about is the bare essentials today. I'll be looking at roads, structures, your house, small properties, defensible space. I'll be talking about plants and then just a um, rousing conclusion at the end. All right, so I hope you're ready. Let's dig in. So roads, you always have to start with roads. And I know not everybody has the opportunity to impact the roads outside of your house, but you can do some stuff. And it is really important to know what kind of danger you have. A majority of the lives lost in wildfires are lost on roads. It's spontaneous and unplanned evacuations. You just get this mass of people on these roads and a good road will enable both fleeing and fighting. We've seen the consequences of bad roads, whether it was the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa or the Camp fire in Butte County, we saw roads shut down and lives were lost. In my fire, the Sentinel fire of mine, we all, everybody has their fire, the Tunnel fire, 25 lives were lost. 19 of those were lost on roads. And most of those roads were narrow, windy, and poor maintenance. People just couldn't flee and fight. Here's some good examples of situations that would shut down a road during a conflagration. The um, Upper left picture, this road was getting a great grade by me when I was um, analyzing this community. Um, great clearance, everything was looking good. And then just this one thing, you know, this pine tree with these dangling dead branches in it, those branches would catch a firebrand, ignite the tree, and absolutely shut down that vital artery during a conflagration. So what was once something to flee and fight on now became a place to fight, battle on, park the engines and actually actively put out the fire. The one in the bottom is a great example of what happens. As densities increase in California, more people are parking on the streets during a conflagration. Not all those cars would leave. That road was originally designed two-lane road, but when you park a car on it, it becomes a one-lane road. If in an emergency, a fire engine was driving up that small road, they would stop right there. There's a high likelihood they would never go any further for fear of not being able to escape back down. Single-lane roads are really dangerous, and emergency personnel go out of their way to avoid them. And then the upper right picture shows a great example of what once was really fire resistant now through poor maintenance has become a fire liability. That storage bin there would easily catch a firebrand, would easily ignite, would probably ignite the garage or that structure next to it. And there again, shut down an artery for fleeing and fighting. So here's some characteristics of a good road. One, you're going to have, um, I'm just going to work with A. A is proper distance. If you are a one lane road, you should be no less than 15 feet wide. In the Oakland Berkeley fire, road width ranged from about 9 to 11 feet. The federal standard for road width is 27 feet. So if you live in fire country, no less than 15 foot wide for a single lane. 
If you are on a single lane, then E is for you, and that's off-street parking. Please create off-street parking. Give up a little bit of your property to make sure that these vehicles can pull over so emergency personnel can roar by. Um, e or J is also um, roll away curbs. So these are the curbs that are not dead straight and they allow when they roll away or mountable curbs are rounded and they allow emergency personnel to drive up the curb, make a U-turn and get out of there. Same with you, it allows anybody to mount those curbs and make a U-turn. D is a, um, address. Make sure your personal address is visible from the street. And these are big less than about um, six, no less than six inches, but nine inches would be better. And those letters want to sit in stark contrast to whatever is behind it. So white and black, blue and orange, you get the picture. Just make sure it's really visible. And then B is just make sure your street signs are visible. During periods of, uh, during a conflagration, uh, street lights might go out. You've seen the pictures of these fires, smoke and embers everywhere. Forward visibility drops during a conflagration at night. And you need those street signs to be absolutely as visible as possible. H is if you live down a, a, a dead end street, make sure please that there's a place for emergency personnel and yourself to turn around. Some emergency personnel will not go down a dead end street if they can't visually see a place to turn around and flee. They're under orders not to risk their lives for unnecessary risk or dangerous situations. Um, and then C is just good clearance. You want flammable vegetation mowed down to four inches on either side of those road, 10 feet on either side of those roads. As you know, cars are a constant source of friction and they start fires themselves. In fact, a lot of the states, some of the state's largest fires were started in, innocently by vehicles, dragging chains, um, an errant spark, and it just took off. So make sure you have clearance on either side of those roads. And then F is about um, uh, road width, minimum of 27 feet. And then G is about just picking um, fire resistant, fire retardant plants and proper maintenance. So these are the characteristics of a really good road. And when we're on, this is the last slide on roads, but firescaping to live in fire country is to live in the gray. Unfortunately, there's no going to save you and this is not going to save you. There's a lot of gray in that and this highlights that example. During the summer months or spring months, this road is fantastic. It cools the drivers, it soothes the drivers, and it brings down driving speeds, which ultimately saves lives most of the year. But during fire weather and a conflagration, those overhanging branches can actually transmit a fire across the road and shut down that vital artery. So here's the gray. How do we manage the cooling, the calming, the life-saving impacts of overhanging branches without the unnecessary risk? Well, a lot of it has to do with thinning. Maybe we don't need that much canopy. Or if we do have overhanging branches, we want to keep them 15 feet above the road so trucks and any kind of vehicle can get through. And we want to make sure that the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation is removed from those trees so they don't become the fuel pathway for over the road. Nothing's easy in fire country. That's what I've learned. So if you don't have a lot of money, but you have a little time and you want to make the road in front of your house, as safe as possible, there's some quick things to do. Please remove the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. This is kindling. This is exactly what a fire would ignite first. Second, make sure you have um, good clearance on either side of the road. 10 feet is um, ideal. I think five feet is the state law. Uh, so 10 feet would be better. 
make sure your address is super visible. Create a parking if you absolutely can. Manage those overhanging branches and communicate and negotiate with your neighbors. What are you going to do during an emergency? This is a good picture. Down below is a picture of um, Tribuco Canyon against the Santa Ana foothills. Um, it's in the unincorporated area of, of Orange County. And the hill behind those homes have burnt twice in the last seven or 18 years. And yet those old homes have survived. But if you look at the road, there's no coincidence there. That road is plenty wide. It has um, off-street parking along the entire street. The limbs have been managed, so it's not encompassing the entire road, but only parts of it. So you get these calming compression impacts with the overhanging branches, but not the degree of risk as if it was along the entire road. And then I might add that those structures are very well maintained, which really helped out in both those um, wildfires. Okay. So your home structures, this is the place to start. This is the thing to work on. I don't know if you know this, but you are more likely to lose your house from a firebrand than direct flame contact. The picture down below is a great example. This is the Wolseley fire from uh, two and a half years ago and it destroyed 1,600 homes in Malibu and Topanga and Ventura and, and over 60% of the homes that were destroyed in that conflagration were destroyed by self-igniting. As you can see in these pictures, there's actually no wildfire around either of these two homes. What it was is they caught a firebrand. Now a firebrand is a spark or an ember that gets picked up by the wind and propelled, pushed well ahead of the fire. The stronger the wind, the bigger the ember that can get picked up and the further it is pushed out. Firebrands can go as far as one mile ahead of the fire front. As you can see in these pictures, there is no fire around these. What it was, was firebrands were raining down on this community from the Santa Ana winds. And anything remotely ignitable was igniting during that time. And they just had something, branches in their gutters, debris on the side of the house, miscellaneous items against the garage door could have ignited and done in either of these two houses. Now these pictures are from Malibu. They're uh, sent to me by an acquaintance of mine who sits on the city council. And he said that of the 60% of the homes that were destroyed by firebrands, 40% of those have been, were ignited from the inside out. That means a firebrand had gotten inside the structure and caused a fire inside of it, so it burned inside and out. Firebrands can enter your structure through your attic, through vents, through the ceiling, around um, garage doors, through open windows. You really want to batten your house. So here's the characteristics of a, a good, good, solid, fire-hardened structure in fire country. And I'll just start with um, C. Why not? <laughs> C is make sure your address is visible on the street. Sometimes firemen are, are told to go to a specific address and you really want to make yours as easy as possible to find. B is using non-flammable materials, oversized lumber, metals, things that are non-flammable or reluctant to burst into flames. G is if you have openings, so you have a big vent to off-gas all that warm air in your house, it would be ideal to have those openings facing away from the high fire hazard area. Also, you want to make sure that those openings are screened. Now, legally, it's screened with no less than a quarter-inch screen. Experts in fire country, though, highly recommend an eighth-inch screen for all your attic screens, any kind of opening um, in the roof or the um, 
the eaves. We have a lot of um, openings under the eaves of our house. We want to make sure the 18th, eight, one eighth inch mesh. Now, A is just about roof type. You want the type A roof, which is by far the most fire resistant. In fact, it's the only one legal in California now. But more importantly, if you're designing a house, you don't want a high, high pitched roof. You want a gentle pitch roof so when the wind and the fire brands hit the roof, it naturally goes over it instead of hitting and stopping. So a low pitched roof. The um, eye is overhangs. If possible, do not build huge overhangs um, on your roof uh, because the larger the overhang, the firebrands get caught. The heat and the firebrands get caught underneath it and it becomes so overheated that the eaves can ignite themselves. F is all about windows. You really want double paned windows to make sure that that radiant heat doesn't get transferred into the structure. And it would be nice to have those windows as kind of small too. We're really used to having these big windows look out into the wilderness and that really creates a liability during the, the Cedar Fire, the Santa Ana winds were going about six, 50 to 60 miles an hour and, and they were picking up objects about an, a quarter, uh, eight to a quarter of a pound and sending them into windows. And nothing short of storm shutters would have protected a structure against that. So small windows reduces your liability of these flying pelting objects. K is all about using fire resistant and fire retardant plants, which we'll be talking about later. E is just non flammable siding. So stucco is obviously the best type of siding but you could even use wood if it was really well maintained and painted with a non-flammable um, paint. And there's a lot of paints that actually advertise as fire resistant. Um, I want to point out too where this, um, where the back area is. See that big open area there? It's really vital if you live on a big property to give the emergency personnel enough space as possible to throw out their equipment and actively fight this fire on this property. You wanna make it as easy for them as possible. You'll notice 2D is um, the pathways around the house are really wide, no less than four feet. When I do a site analysis, one of the very first things I'll do is see if I can actually jog around the entire structure. In most situations in residential properties, I'm actually stopped at two points and it makes it really difficult to go around the house in an emergency. So make sure you have good access around that house. Um, and then H is um, any time overhanging a slope. So you have a, a deck coming out and then the piers coming out. That overhang can catch firebrands and heat and trap them. And so what you want to do is you want to create a skirt, just get some sheet rock or even plywood and paint it with fire resistant paint and just sheet that in or skirt it in. And you're just taking the um, sheet rock and attaching it to the deck and running it all the way down to the ground. And that prevents the fire brands and the heat from getting up underneath that deck. And that's called skirted or skirting. And then J. J is about storing all the flammable items off your structure. We'll be talking about that in, a, in just a minute. So these are the rough overview characteristics of a less flammable fire hardened structure. This is a great illustration of um, how architectural design can really improve your chances of success. This is the old fire in San Bernardino of 2003 and here you can see a lot of good characteristics. Look at the, um, the roof is actually in the same shape as that slope. So when the winds come up that slope, they just go right over that structure. Non-flammable materials. Look at those channels around the structure. Easy to run and work when you're fighting a fire. Big, big driveway there. Not only could you park a fire engine there, 
but you could turn it around. And then look at that big, big work area um, off the back of the property there. Now, that was 2003. We have considerably less water now. That doesn't have to be grass. That could have been gravel or decomposed granite. It could have been gazania or Santa Barbara daisy. It could have been a different plant. It doesn't have to be something so water needy as turf. And here's a quick question. Why do you think the vegetation around this structure is black and then further up the hill, it's gray? Well, I can't hear anybody. Here's the answer, is that um, they were able to get water. So if it's black, it means it never burnt to ash, which means this picture, uh, this, these property owners created a property that was a welcoming beacon to firefighters and they actually stopped and fought the fire. So you can see the water line is where it's black and where it's gray is that's where um, the fire actually roared down and turned to ash. So this is a great example of a, a fire hardened structure. This would be just um, if you're um, here's some good characteristics just nailed in. We have um, small double pane windows. Um, those look like wood shingles, but they're not wood shingles. They are a concrete composite and they are, have a two hour fire resistant rating while well, concrete just doesn't burn. You can see um, underneath the roof here has um, been installed a soffit and a soffit um, covers the rafters and the underbelly of the roof um, protects it from those firebrands and those intense heat and that intense heat from getting up underneath those rafters in the underbelly of that roof and igniting it. We also have key lighting in key areas. So um, this is a big light bulb that will just lead to that area. No clutter around um, the immediate part of this building. This is a fire hardened structure. And, you know, just maybe sort of last point on, on structures here is, does anybody know how many Californian missions were destroyed by wildfires? Zero. We really knew how to live in fire country as early as the early 1700s. And the missionaries had it wired. Look at this, small overhangs, small windows, non-flammable siding. Not one mission was ever destroyed by a wildfire. Although, although San Diego's was destroyed by a riot um, back in the 1800s and upheaval. So in a way, I'm actually surprised I still have a job because <laughs> at one point, Californians actually knew how to live in fire country and then we slowly forgot or I'm not too sure what happened. Um, while we're talking about structures, um, this is the only slide on driveways. I got lucky to do a drive along with some firemen and they were explaining how they respond to an emergency. And what happens during an emergency is, is the fire captain will tell a fire engine, we want you to fend this street. And so this fire engine will go to the street and they'll drive down and looking for a good home that they can save and possibly save others by doing so. And when they're driving up and down the street, your driveway is your communication to those emergency personnel. Your driveway is a bulletin board. It tells the emergency personnel you are either a threat or you're a sanctuary. Driveways are essential in times of conflagration. This driveway, this picture right here, has some really good characteristics. It has a turnaround area for large trucks. It has another turnaround area at the very top of the driveway. Importantly, you can see the structure from the street. So the firemen can actually, on how much maintenance these people have been doing, are they prepared for the conflagration and is it worth their time to come up there and defend it? Another thing that's visible in this picture is you can see actually good accessibility around the entire structure here. Good clearance on either side of this driveway and no overhanging branches to really hem in the emergency personnel. More so, they even put reflectors 
<laughs> right on their corner to try to attract the emergency personnel during a conflagration. This is up in the Sierras. This is um, rough and ready in California, and it has been overrun by fires historically. So these homeowners have gone to great lengths um, to not only defend their property, but to attract emergency personnel. And one of their key ways is making a really inviting driveway. I think the only thing they could have done more was uh, put a lemonade stand out there. Free lemonade and cookies. That would have worked. Uh, it's really important to talk about um, small properties. Uh, the three worst fires in California all involved small properties. And what happens with a small property, homes burn um, anywhere from 18 to 3,000 degrees. That radiant heat is enough to ignite things within 20, sometimes 30 feet from it. So when one small house goes, they just go like dominoes. You can see that the tunnel fire at the upper left, um, that fire is getting pushed down. It's actually getting pushed down that hill by a Diablo wind. And you can see, I don't know if you can see this cursor right here. See this little fire started right there? That was started by a fire brand. That's how important defending against fire brands is. But really this fire spread not only through the Diablo winds pushing it downhill, but through conduction and radiation. It was just the heat was so great. It was igniting everything um, within 30 feet of it. The bottom um, left picture is the campfire in Butte County. And you can see that this entire track was destroyed. That was a horrific, um, horrific fire. The entire town was gone. But startling about that picture is that the vegetation is green. But the vegetation wasn't the flammable item in Butte County. It was mostly those homes. They were all built in the 60s and 70s and had poor maintenance. That was not a rich community. And so when these firebrands ran into these housing tracks of marginal maintenance, they just went up. And when one went up, they all went just like dominoes. You can just see that too in the bottom right. This is the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. When one house went, they all went. And then the top right is um, the old fire in San Bernardino again. And here again, you can see that the vegetation, there was no fire on that slope. It didn't come up and destroy the homes. One home ignited from a firebrand, and it was a domino from all those. There wasn't enough space in between those homes to stop or prevent that radiant heat from igniting the nearby structure. Managing small properties in fire country is critical to our success. Here's some characteristics if you live on a small property in fire country. One, create off-street parking. The density on small lots is so great that without off-street parking in mass evacuation, you will shut down that community for emergency access coming in to fight the fire. Two, try to separate small properties with non-flammable fencing. So uh, ideally, cinder block and cement walls would be the best. They would help buffer that radiant energy coming from a burning structure from going into the nearby property. Two is, is really try to share vegetation as much as possible. You all don't need giant, huge trees. Maybe you can share the expense of, and share vegetation. Importantly, learn this in the tunnel fire and the campfire create multiple ways off your property. So many people will build fences around the property, meaning that they only have one way off. That's the front door, the driveway, and the street. But if the fire is coming this way and your roadway is locked down because of a mass evacuation, your only way out is a way you didn't create. So please negotiate with your neighbors. Just make a fence in between um, and just make sure you have additional ways off your property uh, besides that roadway. Um, the plants you want to use are all a zone one, zone two plants, which are both fire retardant and fire resistant plants. So you really try to avoid the, the most flammable plants like cypress. 
And then, uh, you know, pools are not a bad idea in fire country. Um, they're stored water. They become a source of emergency water during an emergency. And you can also um, throw your either valuables, assuming they're non-electronic, into the pool, or you can just throw flammable items. So if you have a lot of stored lumber in your landscape or a lot of furniture that's ignitable, you can just toss it in your pool and take off. I don't know if you remember the Tubbs fire, but a couple actually lived in their pool overnight and saved themselves. So um, if you have a cover on your pool, they don't have to be a lot of water. You can have a water conserving pool and they sure could come in handy sometimes during um, a conflagration. So here's just um, some good examples. This is LA County. Um, and this is Mount Washington. They've had a long history of wildfires and I did an assessment. And to the left here, we have um, a structure that was uh, built in the early 80s, uh, but the maintenance is just terrible. Uh, look at the fascia by the roof. Um, that fascia is actually pulling apart. It, so when wood ages, it twists and shrinks and stuff. And so when you get this twisting, you get these gaps in between the actual roofing material and the fascia. And if there's a gap, a firebrand can get up underneath there. You can also see the peeling paint all over that, which means if it, it allows a firebrand to attach to the structure. You have single paned large windows, which could easily transmit heat. You have unprotected overhangs, two of them. Um, we have this um, outdoor patio um, that should have a soffit underneath it, but more likely than not, it has poor maintenance. And then this um, balcony or walkway um, here again is poorly maintained, would probably ignite if it was under a firebrand attack. Whereas the house next to it, way better. Double paned windows, smaller windows. Look at the accessories. These shading devices are all non-flammable, they're metal. Um, non-flammable siding, um, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intention. These people created a structure that would definitely survive a firebrand attack, but I don't know if it would survive if the structure next to it ignited. It's living in the gray. Nothing's easy in fire country, that's for sure. So if you only have so much time, so much money, or so much resources, so many resources, put fire hard in your structure. You're more likely to lose it from a firebrand than direct flame contact. So make sure all your openings are screened. I, can't, I cannot stress this enough. Go up to your roof, check those screens, physically push against them because what happens is they rust out over time, especially by the ocean, and they'll just fracture. Sometimes when you hit them, look underneath your eaves and make sure all those openings are done. Clean your roof and your gutters, especially your gutters. If those accumulate, see the gutter sits at a really vital seam because you have the roofing material, you have the plywood, you have the rafters, and then you have the underbelly. And all those are hemmed in by the gutter. If that gutter ignites, it can go in through any one of those seams and ignite your structure. And then manage your seams and gaps. Like the picture to your right is an excellent example of a, um, a siding that could definitely catch a firebrand and ignite. If that was my little structure, I would take a power washer, blast those paint chips right off of it, let it dry out, and then seal those gaps with putty. And even that would cause those firebrands to hit that siding and drop. You just don't want them to stick to your structure. And then if I had the time, I would definitely paint that. And then I cannot stress this enough. Please make sure your address is visible from the street. All right, so that's your home. Now we're gonna take just a couple minutes for the people that wanna do a little stretch and for the people that have some questions so Kyle, um, we'll take your, if anybody has any questions right now, please feel free to um, chime in and we'll just stretch our necks a little bit and um, answer some questions for five minutes. Get up and shut the door.
All right, Doug, so far we don't have any questions. I just want to encourage everyone, if you do have questions, please utilize the control panel at the lower portion of your page. Um, it'll say Q&A. Feel free, you could put in a question at any time and we'll go ahead and answer those for you. Well, I'll wait uh, just, just one more minute and then, uh, then I'll just push on. How's that, Kyle? Sounds great. Okay. I wish, you know, I really wish this was in person. I, I learned so much when I give this presentation to people because Californians have experienced fire since they were children and everybody has these unique um, pearls of wisdom. And I always learn so much. I'm really sorry we're not doing this in person. We're just going to have to invite you back then for an in-person uh, yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I do have a question yeah. uh, from <clears throat> Lisa. She yeah. said, I think people should also update their gas nozzles. It's free and you could turn off gas during earthquake and other tragedies. I don't know if you Excellent have any advice. advice. Excellent advice. Um, yeah. And it, it, even if you don't update it, make sure you have your um, gas wrench which you can buy those uh, wrenches at any home improvement store. That was an excellent uh, advice there, uh, Lisa. Nice job there. We do have yeah. another one. Oh, I'm sorry, Doug. We do have another question from Robert. Uh, will avocado orchard with, orchard with irrigation help stop a fire? Absolutely. Now, Kyle doesn't want you to plant avocado because they are <laughs> exactly. uh, so um, water thrift, um, water uh, meaty nothing is better than food for protecting your structure. Avocados are fantastic. And when we go into the plant section, you'll find out why they're so great because they have so many neat characteristics. Um, food is what the Spaniards used to protect their missions. That was their defensible space was food. And so no food, Robert, if you can afford the water, um, little beets avocado for fire protection. Great. Uh, we have an anonymous question. Uh, how low should the plants be cut next to your home? Yes. Um, we're going to talk about that in um, defensible space, but it really depends on the type of plant and what it is. Um, if it's flammable, just let me get to that when I talk about defensible space. And then um, if anonymous has more questions at the end, if I didn't address it, then I'll take them again. How's that, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Anonymous? Mr. and Mrs. Anonymous, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that looks to be all the questions we have as of now. Okay, well, let's push on. Save your questions. Um, I know we kind of rushed that, but so we'll get back to those. All right, here we go. We're going to push on. So defensible space. You've looked at your roads. You've analyzed your level of risk. You fire hardened your structure. First two things. Now we're going to get into the landscape and, and protect your property from the landscape point of view. So the zone theory, I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with the zone theory. The zone theory is a model of home site protection uh, that was developed in, um, after the Bel Air fire of um, 1963 in LA. That was the Sennel fire. You know, fires have been raging in California for thousands of years, but that was the first fire that rich people lost their lives. Remember when I said 1950s, everybody moved in the hills? Were well, the first to flee were the money with the people with means. And so the Bel Air fire destroyed um, a lot of movie star homes. And so federal and state money poured into LA County, actually the LA Arboretum, and they developed the zone theory, which is now used internationally as a model of home site protection. Zone theory is just three centric zones around a structure. First zone is defensible space the garden zone. The next zone, uh, zone two, is um, the fuel break. And then the last zone is the transitionary zone where you go into the wildlands or a neighboring property. This is the model of the zone theory that Cal Fire had used um, uh, in 2013, 14, and 15 until the drought. And you can see zone one, the big garden zone around here, really green and lush. And then zone two, they went, um, which is the fuel break, we, they went for scorched earth uh, philosophy and just take it right down to mineral. And then zone three, the transition zone, um, you can see that it's all black. 
which means uh, the firefighters had gotten water on it. And you can see that um, this driveway can accommodate a lot of emergency personnel. It's um, nearly 20 feet wide. It includes a generous turnaround area right here. Um, so zone one, you know, the, the quality of zone one is to be able to withstand firebrands and intense heat without igniting. Zone two's job is to be able to stop a, uh, stop a wildfire. So it's either stop the ground fire or stop a canopy fire. And then zone three's job is to reduce the severity of the fire. So we have endure and protect, stop and reduce. Those are the three jobs of the three zones. The only thing is, um, who the heck lives like this? I mean, this is borderline Brad Pitt. They're on top of a ridge. So they have huge property. This is not picture, wasn't really indicative of fire country, and it doesn't represent really the risk that Californians um, face. One, we don't have that much water. And two, nobody can afford that much water. And three, very few people live on properties that are three to four acres. Um, the high fire hazard areas, you know, you may have a standard lot, 10,000, half an acre. Um, and that's about standard in California. So we need a more tailored approach for Californians. Uh, Cal Fire no longer uses that photo. Uh, I think it was because they, the water districts really came down and said, man, we just, we just don't have that water. <laughs> that's a lot of water. So defensible space. Uh, this picture is a little more applicable. <laughs> extends 30 feet out from the house. The goal of this zone is to be able to withstand flying embers, those firebrands, and intense heat. And these, this zone is where you use your most water needy and maintenance needy plants. Although that wasn't the case in this picture, um, you can see very resource conserving um, landscape. Um, with just a small amount of water in as far as the water feature goes. And the water feature is good for wildlife habitat, for fire protection. You can dip a bucket in it, you can dip towels in it and, and put out fire brands. Um, but it's also great, you can throw your jewelry in it um, before fleeing. Zone one has to maintain optional, functional and or economic value which actually drives up the flammability of zone one greatly. But before I go into the 30 feet, we really need to talk about the first five feet. Statistics show that if the first five feet from a, a structure ignite, the chances of that structure igniting go up exponentially. It's just profound what kind of impact that first five feet has. And the reason being, if you get a, a fire to start within that first five feet, the fire can spread through contact flames reaching out and igniting things, or conduction where radiant heat is so great that it goes out and ignites something, but mostly through convection. And what happens when you get a fire right next to a house that it hits the house and you get this column of really hot air rising right up against the house and it will just burn the, um, the overhangs. Um, then to keep flammable stuff. First five feet. So avoid any kind of storage, compost bin, toy boxes, coat and shoe cupboards, recyclables, all that is pulled off. Absolutely no flammable plants, no junipers, cypress, um, uh, eucalyptus, buckwheat. Really want to avoid the plants with a brittle, fragrant nature. And I'll talk about more about this when we get into plants absolutely no woody mulches. In fact, woody mulches are now outlawed uh, within the first five feet. So if you, if you do have plantings up a structure, don't use woody mulches, use humus, which is the most finely decomposed organic matter. It's nutrient giving, it's a fertilizer. Or use inorganics like pebbles, beach rock, gravel, something like that as your mulch. Avoid the use of fabrics. So um, if you have um, fabric shading devices, um, it would be ideal to remove those and, and create metal shading devices. And then um, avoid erecting sh um, arbors and shade structures right up against the house. And I'll show you a picture of this. Oops. Yeah, okay. I'm just gonna illustrate really quick 
why this fly feed is so important. I was doing um, some work for the city of Anaheim and I was surveying this huge area and everything was looking great in this track. It was in a very high flammable area. And then I saw this hill and just stopped. I mean, I saw this property. I, you guys can see what I'm seeing. Do you see the lumber up against the house? I mean, this house has all the neat qualities. Excellent access around the house, non-flammable siding, impeccable maintenance with the roof. The garden looks great. The only problem with this structure is that pile of lumber within that first five feet. Now that house is so solid. I don't know if that lumber would ignite it, but it would definitely divert emergency personnel from more important endeavors. Pull that stuff off that first five feet. I cannot stress that enough. And then shade structures. When shade structures are attached to a house, physically attached to the house, they trap the firebrands and heat up against that house. If you do have a shade structure, try get it off the structure to create a gap to allow those firebrands and heat to move out of that structure. And canting the shade structure also helps too because then you have convection working for you. Hot air always rises. And if you tilt your shade structure, you'll allow that hot air and hopefully those firebrands not to get trapped up into that shade structure. Shade structures would always be built with oversized lumber that has a, a one to two hour fire resistant rating, but metal would be better by far. Metal would be better for shade structures. Here's just some quick, um, quick pictures of some good defensible space. To the left is just a great use of non-flammable materials. Look at those really wide paths. No dead, dying, diseased vegetation in those trees or anywhere. And all that plant material is fairly fire resistant. The bottom, bottom right is a great example of using non-flammable materials. So instead of having a wood wall, it was just recycled concrete. Look at those generous four foot wide paths, stable work area where firemen can lay out their equipment and actually attack the fire. And then the top right is if you live on a slope, what happens on slopes? Every time the slope doubles, so you go from flat to 10%, the um, flame length doubles as well. So if you're on flat ground and you're producing a two foot flame, it grows to four feet on a 10% slope. It grows to eight feet on a 20% slope. And a two foot flame can grow to 16 feet on a 40% slope. That is a big flame. So you can see the dramatic measures are needed on steep, steep slopes. And these three homes have done it. Not only are their homes in great shape, um, well managed, um, and you can see that they're not using a lot of water to create that fire protection. Tree spacing is vital, cannot stress this enough. And that again goes, uh, corresponds to your degree of slope. So the greater the slope, the greater the trees. And uh, you know, remember all this will be available. Um, so if you, you can spend your time with these slides um, at your leisure, uh, any old time. And slow, uh, tree spacing, uh, this is a picture of the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. And you can see that they had no defensible space. They had no five feet clearance. But what is problematic about this picture is that this is endemic. Um, you're looking at a forest that has been regenerating for 15 years. Some of these um, trees are only two or three years old and they just were a sprout that nobody paid attention to that just ignored it and they just turned into trees. So we have two to three year sprouts, we have four to five year sprouts, we have six to seven year sprouts. This forest has been coming into these people for at least 12 years and they have done nothing. It is vital to maintain proper tree spacing in fire country. This is uh, some of the work I did in the lower Sierras um, in the early 2000s. Um, this is Grass Valley and, and Auburn and, um, 
uh, in Nevada City. We were working, doing firework out there. And, and here, the bottom picture is what we really did was try to create islands of trees. So we took out a mass of trees, cut the flammable vegetation down to four inches, and uh, really opened up the property to allow the wind just to pass through so it's not getting held up by the property. Um, they have had tremendous fires roar through their neighborhoods here on the upper right uh, we, here again we took down a lot of trees created big wide paths installed irrigation just along um, the important part of the building high maintenance a little higher water right up against the building uh, to catch those firebrands without igniting and then a meadow further out you can see this big open space which we cleared and this is just a wild meadow um, and so these are just some of the strategies, good tree spacing, big paths, wide accessibility, and no dead, dying, or diseased vegetation in defensible space. We gotta talk about fences. Fences are freeways for fire. They will transmit a fire right down the length of a property. And you can see that these, um, these Italian cypresses are fire traps. I mean, they will readily ignite and that fence will just go up in a second. Uh, this is a historic district, um, which means these woods, these homes are wood and fragile. So here's some remedies for fences. One, try to avoid the use of grape stake um, planks. Uh, those just go up re really easy. Um, so restrict the use of flammable materials. Um, if you can, use oversized lumber, um, use non-flammable materials, and get creative. You don't need wood everywhere. If you're just blocking views, you don't need wood to go all the way down to the ground. You can use wood just where to block the view. Um, and you can see the people in the, this picture have done a great job of minimizing the amount of um, fuels on their small property. When it comes to defensible space, this is where Arnold Schwarzenegger should have really uh, was education. In my work with works with cities and, and um, HOAs and stuff is that I run into rates of compliance with brush clearance in California range from only 8% to 30%. That is dismal, dismal. Only 25% of the people that lost their homes in the Tubbs fire had proper clearance. And the reason that is actually so high that people lost their homes is because it was small lots that were burning. You may have had great maintained um, gardens, but because the houses were so close to when one ignited, they just dominoed. It is really tough to talk to your neighbors and to your community to get them just to comply with basic brush clearance, remove the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation from just 30 feet. Did you know that if you create just 30 feet of defensible space and you have a fire-hardened structure, you have over a 90% chance of survival? We actually didn't need that 100-foot law. We really needed Californians to concentrate on that 30 feet and their structure. That alone would have saved massive amounts of structures in California. Do you guys see this? You guys seeing what I'm seeing? The Mexican fan palm? I didn't take this picture to be cheeky. Um, I'm, this picture is in Anaheim again. This is an HOA, took that other picture. And this track, this, um, Homeowners Association was doing really good. The house had solid maintenance, great vegetation clearance around the actual um, community. It's hard to tell this picture was taken early spring and they hadn't weed whacked yet, but all the signs were there. They really cared. But this Mexican fan palm was a weed. It was a volunteer. It was never planted. And, and they grow a new layer every year. And I counted it. That's about eight or nine years old. And you can see the pup the pup right next to it, which is about two to three years old, those are just weeds. Nobody ever pulled those. And here's the problem with this picture is five groups of people 
ignored this fan palm for eight to nine years. So we had the two homeowners that just didn't see it. We had the landscape maintenance company, which just didn't see it. We had the um, landscape committee for the HOA that didn't see it. We had the board of directors that didn't see it. And we had Orange County Fire Authority, which is their district to maintain, never saw this. But it's really, we all saw this. As soon as I put this slide up, I'm sure everybody in this webinar saw this. But somehow we need to get everybody to see this danger and see the danger when this Mexican fan palm is only this tall. When it was this tall, it would have been um, a 20 minute back pull to get that out. Now this is gonna cost $1,500 if not more to remove this tree. If we see something, we have to be bold enough to say something in fire country. We need to be the spark that creates safety and renewal. And I'm just gonna go back to Mrs. Baylor here, um, my very first fire I covered as a reporter. Look at some of the characteristics that she has for defensible space. One, not a lot of plants. Two, big, generous pathways, four feet wide that you can just run around the structure. Um, she let those pine needles drop on the ground floor, but she only left them at a half an inch just enough to act as a weed barrier to deter weeds, but not enough to create a huge fire problem, to create a, a ground fire that would just go and go and go. So her mulching is really thin, just enough to deter weeds, but not enough to create danger. So we had great clearance, the removal of dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. Um, we had well-watered plants, properly maintained plants, and, um, an excellent um, control of her mulches and, and the dead pine needle. So in defensible space, if you don't have a lot of money, you can't go in there and completely redesign this season. Remove all flammable items within that first five feet. Please manage that first five feet. Remove dead, dying, and diseased vegetation from that 30 feet. Take what a, a wildfire would. Remove the kindling from your defensible space. Maintain an inviting driveway like this picture. Look at this driveway, big, wide. Uh, looks like 12 feet, 12 to 15 feet, and a generous turnaround uh, for the fire engines here. And do not let your plants dry out. You know, during the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa, they were experiencing a drought. The whole state was in a drought uh, two years ago, but they were in a greater drought than we were. And what they did is they turned off all their irrigation. So that was their residential landscapes, the parkways, the mediums, commercial landscapes. Just everybody shut off the vegetation. And they paid for it with an incredible amount of dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. So when that fire hit, it hit a landscape that was dry. If you have to turn off your irrigation, and you have plants that are dependent on that irrigation, you must remove the plants. You simply just cannot turn off the water and expect everything to be okay. You turn off the water, you really need to remove the dependency of that water. Okay, defensible space. Now plants, everybody loves plants. Everybody wants plants in fire country, plant list. All right, let's get to it. What I've learned, um, from my work in fire, knowing trades is far more important than plant lists. There's like 4,000 commercially available plants, more than that in California. And I think there's 3,500 um, California friendly plants. How do we remember plant lists? That's why traits are more important than remembering plant lists. So here's the characteristics of a less flammable plant. One, broad leaves opposed to conifers are less flammable. Moist and easily bent leaves. Um, pictured below is, is carrot pansa and um, corobels, hookera. And if you pick up those leaves, you can just bend them and twist them. That means really non flammable. If you take like um, other plants and you bend and they just break apart, that would be a flammable characteristic. Thick leaves are less flammable than thin leaves, like the purple hop seed, the dodendia. 
It has a small, thin, wafer-thin leaf that when you bend it, it actually breaks. Um, that would be a characteristic of a flammable characteristic. Sap that looks more like water. So if the sap of the plant is resinous, it would be more flammable as a consequence. Plants without fragrance. Fragrance means oils. Uh, plants turn their water into oils for a variety of reasons, to conserve water, to repel predators, to attract pollinators. It's a, an essential survival attribute of Mediterranean plants. It also makes them more flammable as a consequence. Um, plants with silver or gray leaves are less flammable. Gray is a plant's adaptation to too much solar energy. Um, so if they're getting more energy than they can metabolize, and plants have evolved to create gray leaves to reflect that energy back into the atmosphere. And the way they get that gray look is through pulling minerals from the soil. So when you have leaves that are gray, means a high mineral content and they're less flammable as a consequence. And then plants without hair like the California sycamore and the Fremontia um, have both really hairy leaves and they're more ignitable as a consequence. When it comes to actual plant lists, um, there's two types and, and the genesis of this information came from the LA Arboretums in the 1970s. And what this guy did, Mr. Um, Kenneth Montgomery, is he built this huge chamber and he put burners in there and a fan in there and he started throwing in all different types of plants and measuring them. How fast did they ignite? How much heat did they produce when they ignited? And how long did they stay aflame was his measures. And through that, he came up with two plant lists, fire retardant and fire resistant. Fire retardant plants, Mr. Montgomery found out, um, just sizzle and wilt in extreme heat, they really don't produce a flame. Some of the fire retardants are lily of the Nile, redbud, crepe myrtle, fescue, flax, gazania, liquid amber, philodendron, photina, succulents, all your succulents. And look at all these plants, they have big leaves, they're bendable, there's no heavy fragrance, and there's not a lot of litter. These are plants that are just probably going to sizzle if they're well maintained. Well, fire resistant, we use them further out in zone two. These plants may ignite in a firebrand, but they've evolved to quickly sort of extinguish themselves. What happens is the flame hits that hard, dense wood and it can't go any further and it just flames out. There's no more fuel. And these plants are really important in zone two and three because in California, we know one disaster begets another and erosion, topsoil loss, and debris flows follow fires in California. So we really want plants that rapidly re-sprout and can recover from disturbance like wildfire. So most of your fire-resistant plants are your tough chaparral plants. Artemisia, Ceanothus, rock rose, coast live oak is incredible at resisting fire. Cotoneaster, lemonade berry, all your mallows are wonderful, big leaf. Uh, your verbenas, I think all your verbenas. Uh, toyon, yarrow is incredible, and even yucca. These would be considered fire resistant plants. And more importantly, they're both resource conserving, the amount of biological activity um, and diversity, which are all big benefits. A uh, picture below is we have Santa Barbara daisy, that white. We have geranium and canum and gazania, the two types, both the clumping and the trailing. Um, and this would be a, a great, excellent lawn alternative in fire country. If you want to work from a plant list, I love plant lists. I organize all the plants I know into lists. So if I'm looking for bee friendly plants, I just go to my bee list. And, and so here's some plant lists that if you, if you want to go to a nursery or you're working with your gardener on fire resistant plants, you can work from these lists, bird plants. Um, so that would be all your um, small fruiting trees like elderberry, cotoneaster, toyon are all very fire resistant. So 
most bird plants are really good um, for fire protection. Food, nothing beats food for protection. Whether you're planting lettuce, tomatoes, or some of your bigger crops like blueberry or um, uh, Robert and his avocados, nothing beats food for fire protection. They'll catch the fire brands igniting. And food crops are typically really well maintained, which is just an added benefit. Lawn alternatives, which I already discussed, the Santa Barbara daisy, the gazania, are all fantastic. Um, there's a lot of medicine crops um, that are really fire resistant. So that's plantain lily, yerba mansa, uh, whorehound are all fantastic at resisting fire. Um, if you're gonna work with your native plants, some of the plant communities that are the most fire resistant are definitely your chaparral. Um, so those are the plants found in eastern San Diego County, and that's your toyon, ceanothus, lemonade berry, sugar bush, um, your ribes, which is your currant, and gooseberry are all really fire resistant. Uh, desert plants did not evolve to fire, um, and they have incredible um, resistance. And then woodland understory, which this picture is right here. Um, the coral bells and the carrot pansa are both woodland understory. This includes columbine, um, your irises. Um, they typically need a little more moisture than a lot of your other native plants, and they're less flammable as a consequence. And then succulents, that's a no-brainer. Um, all your um, hens and chicks, um, crassula, um, stuff like that. Sedum is just fantastic at um, fire resistance. They're actually fire retardant. Uh, your temperate plants, like the liquid ambers, um, azaleas, are uh, really fire resistant. And then tropicals. Not that we recommend these in California because they're so water needy, but some of the subtropicals are very water conserving and excellent. The subtropicals would be like daylily, agapanthus, um, bird of paradise are all very fire resistant. However, though, you know, I don't like plant lists. Plant lists are terrible. In fire country, they can give us a, uh, a delusional thing, thinking that everything's okay when it's not. I have visited so many fires that I know every plant will go up if it's not maintained. So any plant, too old, diseased, injured, pest infested, not healthy, too dry, will ignite. Plant selection will not save you. Maintenance will. Here's a good example. When I was living in Northern California, this is Santalina and Heavenly Bamboo. So this is Heavenly Bamboo and this is Santalina. Both are fantastic plants recommended in fire country. The only thing is, both these are too old. That Santalina would definitely catch a firebrand, ignite, and the heat it produces would easily be transferred through this thin single pane window and ignite that tissue paper like curtains just beyond it. Plant maintenance is what's needed in fire country, not plant selection. Here's a good example too. This is the campfire. I was there for the one year remembrance uh, ceremony and I uh, spent three days up there and this was a common sight. So on the picture to the right, um, right behind me, I mean really right behind me, six feet behind me is um, a burnt out house. This entire tract was destroyed. So hundreds of homes in this home tract was destroyed and yet live juniper was everywhere. The juniper was the least flammable thing on this little plateau where I was. It was the structures that were the flammable things. The structures were more flammable than juniper. So be careful. And in this fire, I saw so many ants that had been burned to ash, like oleander. And it was just that nobody was taking care of these plants. The juniper survived because it didn't have dead, dying, or diseased vegetation in it. It didn't have kindling. Here's another good example of the problem with plant lists. This is Miss Baylor again, and she's in the middle of a bishop pine forest. Now, if you know anything about bishop pines, they are fire dependent. Their pine cones need fire 
to heat up. And what happens when they heat up, they literally explode, bam, and they make a huge noise and send their seeds in every direction. She was able to survive because in a way she acted like fire. She created great separation between these flammable trees, she picked up the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation, not only from the ground, but from the trees themselves, and then stopped the, the shrubs from growing around the base of the trees to lead the fire up into the canopy. You can live with flammable vegetation. It's really how we treat our landscape. It's not what we put on it. It's how we interact with our landscapes is gonna create this degree of fire safety. So when it comes to plants, I cannot stress this enough, and I, please remove dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. This is what fire is going to take first. Replace your vegetation before it becomes an economic liability or fire risk. So many of the plants on our, on our residential lots, we treat them as pets. We have such emotional connections to them that we wouldn't dream of ever cutting down a family member Get that, but fire doesn't share your sentiment and you're either going to be the source of renewal and change or fire is so some people you know we just need to man up a little in, in fire country and then please do not let your plants dry out even the most water conserving which would be like the chaparral plants need water at least once a month a big deep soak to bring up that leaf moisture levels. And here's a good example of a very fire resistant landscape. Um, and this is actually a picture was taken in um, Santa Rosa a year before that tragic fire. Okay, now I just have a, I think a three or four slide conclusion and then uh, we'll be nearly done. If you live in fire country, just own it. Just own it. Um, does any, has anybody ever lived in bear country? In bear country, it's really interesting that um, if you make a mistake and don't live in bear country, if you don't act on bear country protocol, you'll pay for it immediately. If you leave your car unlocked, you leave food in your car, you leave a, a, a trash can open, you leave your garage door open, you will pay for it that day. And no matter where you travel, those protocols travel with you. So if you go to Canada in bear country, everybody will speak that same language. Oh, bring your food in before the bears get it or make sure you shut your car doors and, and lock it really good. You can go anywhere, Montana, Canada, Washington, and, and those protocols will follow you wherever you go. And, and the same thing is living in fire country is we just need to own it and live by these protocols. It won't impact us that day but it's going to impact us if we don't. The problem this year though is uh, we're in a state of change. Um, fire response is going to be very hobbled this year. And I know the government and CAL FIRE are working really diligently to overcome the COVID restrictions. But what we're gonna see is less firemen in fire trucks. We're going to see base camps that are going to be um, dramatically spread out. You're not gonna be able to get uh, 500 guys into a camp and feed them, um, which means base camps are gonna be much smaller and more distant, um, which you're gonna have some communication problems because, and importantly, our evacuation centers are gonna dramatically change. We're not gonna be able to put thousands of people into a high school gymnasium uh, that's just not possible with COVID. COVID is dramatically going to change our response this year, and it could hamper it, and it could hobble it, which really puts the onus on the homeowners to make sure that their property is ready for anything this year. It would be a risk to rely on um, emergency personnel uh, this year. And I might add that California, we have 8,000 wildfires a year. California is already above average on the amount of wildfires we have. Now, most wildfires are only a couple acres and we extinguish them so fast because we're so good at it. But still the increase in average number is alarm bells should go off in Californians. 
if you live in fire country, we just really need to embrace our, our nomenclature and our rituals. This is our shared ethic. So row into any community, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, and look at the roads and have a meaningful conversation with that homeowner and say, hey, you're looking really good on your roads here. And you should be able to have that dialogue. Structures, everybody should be able to walk up to a house and be able to identify the characteristics that are either dangerous or fantastic. Same with first five feet, defensible space, and plants. Now again, my presentation just focused on the 30 feet because statistically, that is essential. Further out, statistically, it becomes a little less um, statistically important, but that first 30 feet is profound. These are our rituals. These are our rituals. I encourage all of you is to create Eden. Our garden should be our sanctuary. I love gardening. I just absolutely love it. And I get my medicine from it and I get my food from it. Um, and I really try to create a, an Eden someplace. That I'd, there's no other place in the world than I'd rather be in my garden. And if everybody in California did that, you would see fire risk drop. Your well-being is right outside your door if you're capable of creating it. And that's where fire protection is going to come in is if we create a sanctuary, something that will heal us, care for us, protect us, that's what a landscape should do. And I hope I gave you some of the tools to do this in this presentation. So we're gonna conclude with a couple remarks from uh, Kyle. All right, thank you, Doug. Uh, before we get into our last section of questions, those are coming, so if you guys want to go ahead and input some more questions, I encourage you to utilize the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today, um, especially Doug, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, just to go over something quickly, uh, we do have some upcoming workshops available. If you enjoyed today's webinar and you'd like more information on featured classes, please visit our website, ranchowater.com forward slash workshops. Uh, just a little side note, if you were to log in today, you will not see any upcoming events because we're currently working on scheduling those. Uh, so please continue to visit this page for updates on uh, upcoming classes. Also, um, if you're unaware, we do have rebates available for you as a Rancho Water customer. Uh, whether you want to replace your existing lawn with the drought resistant landscape or even fire uh, resistant plants, or even upgrade your old irrigation controller to a weather-based irrigation controller, there is money available to help assist with these efficient practices. So definitely um, take a look at our website, ranchowater.com forward slash rebates for more information. Um, below you'll see a list of rebates, but if you wanna get some more information uh, regarding each of these individual um, features, you could go online and definitely go see those on our website. So Doug, if it's okay with you, uh, we do have some questions. Yes, of course. I am going to pull those up. Um, and I, I want to add to Kyle, um, yeah. anybody can email me if you want. So if you have a question that you prefer offline, uh, my email is newair at mindspring.com. So that's N E W. A I R at mindspring.com. So if the question was a little more involved, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get to it. Great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, first question's from Mark. He, uh, it's a comment and, and a, a question. He says, it seems like a lot of people like to plant pepper trees because they don't require a lot of water. Um, are these highly flammable? There again, uh, Mark, that's an excellent question. That is in the gray. Pepper trees are right <laughs> smack dab in the middle. They have a lot of great characteristics. Um, if they're well watered and they're clean, they create a lot of um, twiggy, dead um, um, middle stuff. I mean, it, they create a lot of ignitable material. But if that ignitable material is removed and they're well watered, they should be fairly fire resistant. 
But the problem is that they do um, can go through an incredible leaf drop and then they can um, produce a lot of that twiggy, stemmy, dead stuff in their canopy. And that's the risk of them is how we maintain them. Um, most part, I've, I've been to a lot of fires and I've seen peppers do pretty well. Um, not as well as oaks, but they do pretty well. And again, um, their success is based on the amount of maintenance they receive. That's been my experience. Great question, Mark. Lisa, Lisa has a worry about neighbors who don't have an HOA that will not comply um, with this presentation and endanger their neighbors. Um, she said that some may not care and others may not be able to afford to do the proper thing. I know your slides mentioned, that was more of a comment, Doug, but I don't know mm -hmm. if you wanted to comment on that. And maybe um, is there any resources that um, you would recommend for people in HOAs and non-HOAs to learn more about um, fire protection and, uh, you know, fire-friendly plants? Yeah, that is phenomenal. Um, I, I don't know if I can address HOA, but I, you have to have brush clearance in California, period. It's, it's a law. If you were designated as a high-risk zone or a very high-risk zone, those actually change legally, um, you have to maintain uh, defensible space. And so if you have neighbors that are not um, you can actually call the governing agency, which would be the city or county fire department, and have them come in and write a citation. But unfortunately, if the people don't have means, there's nothing they can do. So the extreme case of that would be that the fire agency would come in, perform the work, and then put a lien on the house. But I'll tell you, um, fire agencies don't like that work at all, and they have been super reluctant to do it. So if you're living around neighbors that don't even have the energy to remove weeds, unfortunately, the only thing you can do is create a highly protected property for yourself and just hope that when their property goes down, that your property is, is cared for enough that it won't ignite. You know, that was the campfire was um, so many people up there didn't have the means to really, most of them were rentals and they didn't have the means or the wherewithal to manage their properties. And that's why it caused such heavy devastation. And so that's a, Lisa, that is a tough, tough, man, that was a tough comment or question there because it, it really perplexes Californians across the entire state is how to deal with remiss, ap apathetic um, land managers. So good luck to us all, Lisa, really. Great. And um, in regards to fire resistant plants, a question was asked, um, how about jasmine, rosemary, and lavender or sage? Are those um, fire resistant, considered fire resistant plants? <laughs> okay. So um, rosemary is sort of fire resistant when it's really young, but when it gets old, it's got all the characteristics of a flammable plant, right? Small, brittle leaf, twiggy, dense interior, and incredible aromatics. So I would not plant rosemary um, within 10 feet of a house unless I knew I could really well main, you know, I could properly maintain it. Um, you know, one or two rosemaries is not gonna endanger anything. And the same goes with lavender. When lavender is young, you can put it in an oven and it won't ignite. But you take a four or five year old lavender and put it, you know, over your flame on your stove it will readily ignite. So there again, it's maintenance. Lavender when it's young is incredible. Lavender when it gets old becomes really ignitable, just like Santalina, that picture I showed. Now sage, it depends on which sages. There's hundreds of salvias. So if it's like the fuchsia flowering or the, um, the non-aromatic sages, those are fine. Big leaves, supple leaves, those are perfect. But when you're talking about the aromatics, the white sage, black sage, purple sage, um, you're, you're taking a risk there. Um, how's this? I wouldn't use those within the first 10 or 20 feet of a structure, but a little further out, you know, we're all concerned about um, California leads the nation and number of extinct, endangered, and threatened aquatic and terrestrial species. And it's really important to see if we can get some of these species back. So those plants are vital. Just use them a little further out from the, from the structure and create that, that Eden really close to it. I, don't, um, I work a lot with the cooking sage. I have it in my garden and um, 
you know, I maintain it and I'm harvesting it all the time. And I don't think cooking sage is a risk at all, but it does have aromatics, but the leaf is supple and moist and stuff like that. There was a fourth plant. I don't think I covered there. It was a uh, jasmine, rosemary, lavender, and sage. Jasmine is wonderful. The only problem with um, the star, I, I'm assuming the star jasmine is that it builds up that thatch over time. So every two years, just like ivy, you really should take um, star jasmine down to four inches and let it really build back up with that new, supple, green, fire-resistant growth. I want to reiterate this. It, it's maintenance, not plant selection. So great questions, whoever that was. Um, one question from Lisa said, uh, behind her home, I believe it's a ravine with a lot of pine trees. Uh, they're really tall and they're not maintained. Um, and she lives in Temecula. So just if you could quickly discuss pine trees and what you'd recommend for Lisa in, this, in the current position she's in. Well, here, Lisa can't do anything about those pine trees. Those trees are obviously a fire risk if they're not maintained. I mean, you know pines will just have dangling uh, pine leaves all over its canopy and it will absolutely catch a firebrand, ignite and propel and um, build the fire. Those are a risky endeavor. If you can't through community action get those removed or cleaned, then your only other option, Lisa, is to make sure again that your home is as solid as possible. I mean, really, at the end of the day, the only thing you can control is your property. Um, it really takes a large community activist to go in and, and change government or agency or, or private property. It takes a lot of work, as I know from my work in Northern California. You know, Lisa, I'm sympathetic to your endeavors. It's, it's really tough to to live in communities that don't care as much as you do about fire safety. So that's all I got. All right. Uh, last question so far, if anyone wants to, again, we encourage you to ask questions if you would like to do so. But the last question we have uh, is from an anonymous person. You said that you're going to talk about uh, storing uh, f uh, flammable liquids in a structure away from the house. What should be stored? Well, if you had flammable liquids, I would actually store those in my garage in a, um, a fire safe container. Though every commercial business has them. If you have any kind of paint thinner paints, you just buy that metal, um, two walled metal um, storage would be the absolute best. Those are expensive though. Those are like um, five to eight hundred dollars to store paints, but they are incredibly uh, fire resistant in that. The radiant heat is really, it's, it's tough to get that radiant heat into the interior of those devices to ignite um, the paints inside. But I, I'm not too sure I would even store paints outside. Um, I would keep them inside um, in a fireproof container. That was a good question. I think that's two for Mr. Anonymous. <laughs> we have one more. Um, what about installing large sprinklers on large properties to wet down the surrounding area? Great. Um, you know, I work with Malibu and Topanga a lot, and that comes up. Um, it, 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 it's excellent, but it comes with a caveat. I mean, no doubt about it, irrigating. Um, so you, you get the call to evacuate, turning on the sprinklers and irrigating your structure and the landscape is fantastic. But there, but there are some potential problems here. One is um, make sure your water district pumping can handle that first because um, what had happened in the Oakland tunnel fires is people had done that. They turned on all their sprinklers and f just took off. And with the power outages and the massive use of water, what it had done is just dropped the water pressure so low that uh, firefighters were having uh, very little pressure at their hydrants. So you really want to discuss it with your water district and see what their pumping capacity is um, because if you do it, many members of your community are going to do it as well, and it may impact emergency re response. If you have a new water district, you're pumping good, and the pumps may be on emergency generators, which ensures water pressure during emergency, in which case, yes, um, you can have an emergency watering system, which is pre-wetting the landscape, 
and you can actually have hoses, uh, you know, one inch hose to shoot out a significant source of water so you can physically fight it. I think it's a good idea. Uh, the only other caveat with that is um, if a landscape gets too wet, it makes it really tough to fight a fire on, um, especially if it's slope. So if you're irrigating your slope and you've left that irrigation on for an hour, and then the emergency personnel get there and they try to scramble up a wet slope, it just turns, especially clay soil, just turns into a slip and slide. So those were some of the problems that have come up with emergency watering systems. But for the most part, they're beneficial. Um, again, they're, uh, you know, make sure the water pressure can handle it. And, and you know, there's the expense of it too, is they're a different system. They may need to be on their own pump, not on municipal water. I mean, um, they may need, need a, a pump booster. So they may need a generator, a pump. So sometimes emergency watering systems can get a little expensive. So if you've got the means, I would definitely investigate it. It, it, it pays off from, from what I've seen in fire country. Great. We do have a, um, another question. How about roof sprinklers? Yeah, so roof sprinklers are great. Um, here again, um, the only problem with the actual roof sprinklers is your roof itself, the tiles, are not flammable. If they were built from the 80s on, um, they are the most fire resistant materials. So really, you almost want the water not to come down from the structure and then flow down. You actually want the water to go up into the structure. So up into the roofing tiles and up into the eaves and up up against the side of the house because really a firebrand on your roof isn't a liability unless your roof is covered with debris. The liability is the heat coming up underneath the eaves and the heat and the, and the firebrands coming in the gaps of um, the fascia, um, the wood siding if there's gaps. So a lot of people you're seeing in, in fire country, especially in Malibu, are now actually shooting water straight at the structure and then letting it drop into that first five feet instead of letting the water just naturally run down um, the, side, the top of the structure. So it really depends on how your structure is built and, and your goals. That was a darn good question. That was a good one. Okay. It's been years since I've gotten that one. <laughs> I think that concludes the questions. Um, if anyone has any more, you could go ahead and put that now. But um, yeah, that concludes the questions so far. Yeah, and feel free, um, feel free to, um, feel free to email me if you have more questions. And I just want to highlight something too. I hope you can see this. This is the California Friendly Maintenance book. Um, I was the writer, but. That's not saying much because it had 14 editors um, and this was, um, it's absolutely free. You can get this book from bewaterwise.com and it covers everything about modern maintenance. Um, the longevity, how long plants live, how much irrigation they need, what kind of fertilization they need. Um, it covers stormwater systems. It covers managing um, surfaces like mulches and DG and gravel. And it's free as it was done through a first ever collaboration between LADWP, Metropolitan Water District, and Southern California Gas. Um, and your water district, Kyle, may have some hard copies, might, that he could give away, but it is free to download from bewaterwise.com. And it's just a great resource on um, maintaining California friendly landscapes. So there's that. Excellent. Uh, we did have one more question that came in. How about barricade gel products? Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, that, that had come up in Malibu. There was a lot of people that had that. And it's it both, it's phenomenal if you can afford it, but it has to be applied just right. Um, it's, uh, following the Woosley fire, I got to work in Malibu quite a bit and with the city council. And I was working um, with this guy and he said his neighbor lost his house despite having that gel is because he gelled his house, but he didn't cover it exactly right. And so he had left some vulnerable areas. So it, um, it's expensive and it needs the right application. But if you do those two things, you, you pay the expense and you apply it right, it offers a fantastic defense. 
And in fact, I work with a guy up in Palmdale who does, um, he has a 150 acre sanctuary for um, shelter animals. And he uses the gel on his structures and he says it's been fantastic out there. So, but again, it's expensive and it needs to be done right. Great. Well, the, that's the end of the questions. And um, again, I really appreciate everyone joining us today. A big thanks to Doug. You can find his book. I saw it on Amazon, so uh, you can find that available. And if anyone has any more questions, uh, Doug said his email's right there on the screen for you. Um, you could go ahead and email him or email my, um, you can email me and you should have received that during the invitation. So thank you again, Doug, very much. And I hope you all have a great Saturday. Well, Kyle, thank you. And it was a pleasure to spend the, the morning with your community. So really thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you. Let's make California safer. Woo. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again and have a great day, everyone. Okay.